All right. So we are going to be diving into something called schemas in early childhood. So like uh, we were just saying, these are repeated patterns of behavior. But before we get started, I'd like to take just a few minutes uh, to share some information about me as the host and the creator of this presentation for those of you who might be joining one of my sessions for the first time. So my name is Heather White. I'm a former Montessori classroom teacher, administrator, and in-home caregiver with uh, more than 15 years of experience now in the world of Montessori. Currently, I work as an educational coach and consultant. Uh, I work for the Center for Guided Montessori Studies in multiple roles. I'm their alumni coordinator, conference coordinator, webinar coordinator, uh, but then I also work with adult learners who are working to receive their Montessori certification. I'm also a blog writer and content creator for a few different organizations, including the American Montessori Society and Guide and Grow. I hold certifications from the American Montessori Society in the three to six and six to nine age groups. I also have experience working with the nine to 12 and zero to three age groups as well. I have a master's in education with a concentration in Montessori studies and an education specialist degree in school psychology. And I am also a nationally certified school psychologist. During our time together today, we're going to start by talking about what schemas are and when they happen. We'll then take a look at the nine most common schemas in early childhood and some activities uh, specifically Montessori activities that can be implemented that align with or relate to those schemas. Then I'll share some resources and we'll have a few minutes, like I said at the end, for some questions. Okay, so what are schemas? Schemas are those repeated, uh, repeated, excuse me, repeated patterns of behavior that children demonstrate through their play. These schemas often facilitate a child's development and really help them to learn more about the world around them. It's important to know that schemas aren't necessar necessarily Montessori aligned. Uh, if you've been to some of my sessions in the past, you know that Montessori is my specialty. So I do want to make that important distinction that schemas aren't specific to Montessori. Um, something that's specific to Montessori is what Dr. Montessori called sensitive periods, and they're similar, uh, but not exactly the same. However, schemas can be helpful for us as parents and caregivers and educators, even if we do uh, embrace the Montessori philosophy and pedagogy, because they can help guide our observations of children when they're playing. And they can help us as the adult to understand a child's interest and then to follow the child, as Dr. Montessori said, helping us to make modifications to the environment and introduce activities that align with the child's interests so that we can further promote their brain development through this creation of what she called a prepared environment. So then when do schemas take place? There is no set timeline of when schemas occur or even a, a specific delineation of how long they might last. They don't occur in a specific order. And in fact, multiple schemas can be occurring at one time and they might even combine as well. Some children will have very strong, clear schemas that are easily observable, while others might be more subtle. And some might not even engage in schematic play at all. So every child is different. So then what are we looking for uh, when we're sitting down to observe a child to see if they are exhibiting schematic play? There are nine common schemas that are present in early childhood. They are the connection schema, enclosure, enveloping, and these two are very similar. We'll get into that in just a moment. Orientation, positioning, rotation, trajectory, transformation, or also known as the transforming schema, and then transportation or the transforming or transporting schema. Those are kind of a little tongue twister, right? You have transforming and transporting. Um, so we're going to take a look at each of these and explore them on a bit of a deeper level, figuring out what they mean, what these play uh, types of play look like if a child is engaged in this schematic behavior, and then also what 
uh, activities we can introduce that align with that child's interests. So the first is the connection schema. A connection schema includes an interest in joining things together, connecting different objects, and also opening and closing things. In this schema, young children are really examining how things come together or come apart. They're starting to develop an understanding of cause and effect. They're learning pre-science and mathematics skills as well, like prediction and estimation. And they're also developing fine motor skills and a sense of spatial awareness. Some common activities that support a child who would be in a connection schema are things like locks and keys, dressing frames, nuts and bolts, lacing boards, uh, containers with lids, and lacing or weaving activities. And you'll notice that when we get to these slides for each of the nine schemas, these are all traditional Montessori activities. Uh, the dressing frames are a staple in a Montessori early childhood classroom. Um, you'll often see locks and keys, nuts and bolts, lacing boards, but these are also things that can be implemented in a home setting or in a more traditional classroom environment as well. The next schema we're going to take a look at is the transforming or the transformation schema, and this involves an interest in combining or changing materials or mixing things together. In this a transforming or transformation schema, young children are really uh, developing their fine motor skills and are also continuing to learn about cause and effect. They're also diving into those pre-science skills of observation and prediction. What's going to happen when I mix these things together, right? And they're making a guess about what that's like internally. If a child is in a transforming schema, some things they might enjoy are helping you cook right? There's so much mixing and combining that goes into play uh, when cooking and baking. Making fresh juice, right? Squeezing an orange um, or even a lemon to make lemonade. And they might also enjoy painting, uh, finger painting in particular for a very young child where they're mixing all of the colors together uh, would be really engaging and rewarding for a child in a transforming schema. The next schema is the orientation schema. And this is the child who has an interest in experimenting with different viewpoints, like hanging upside down. Um, I love that picture there where the child's looking upside down through their legs, so cute. Um, in this schema, a young child is really developing their body awareness, their spatial awareness. They're working on developing their gross motor skills. And they're also exploring, exploring stimulation through their sensory and vestibular systems. When you move your body in a different orientation, when you turn upside down, even for us as adults, we get different sensory feedback. And that's what a child is craving and really enjoying and learning from uh, at an early age, especially if they are in this orientation schema. If you notice that a child is enjoying uh, these activities and are likely in an orientation schema. Some things that you might want to introduce uh, that they might enjoy would be yoga, uh, using a material that's often found or should be found in all Montessori early childhood classrooms called the red rods. An extension with that material is creating a maze. You see the child has arranged the uh, red rods into a maze and is walking through it. Um, learning tower activities. So sometimes these um, helpful tools are called kitchen towers or learning towers, but they really help the child to be independent uh, to access the counter either in the kitchen or the bathroom for care of self activities like brushing their hair or teeth, uh, also in helping cook in the kitchen. But it gives them a different perspective, right? It's lifting them up. And then another really fun uh, tool that is found in a lot of Montessori homes is called the Pickler Triangle or the Climbing Arch. And this really, again, allows the child a different perspective as they're climbing up. Sometimes there's even a um, slide that goes with it uh, or something that actually looks like an arch rather than having this triangle design. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a climbing triangle and then you have the arch separately. But again, all of those tools really allow the child to just take on a different 
vantage point, which they're really craving if they're in that orientation schema. The next schema is the trajectory schema. And this is when a child has an interest in moving objects. Uh, these are the children who really like to throw things, drop things, roll them. And it might also include an interest in moving their own body. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard uh, parents ask, why do they throw their toys instead of playing with them? Or when I put them in the high chair, I know they're hungry. Why are they dropping their food on the floor? Uh, and there's a good reason, and it's the trajectory schema. So let's find out what they're learning by doing that. So when a young child is engaging in those behaviors, when they're in this trajectory schema, they're developing their gross motor skills if they're moving their own body or if they're throwing, right? They're developing body awareness, visual tracking skills. If you drop an object and then watch it fall, that's visual tracking. They're also practicing observation. They're learning about cause and effect. If I throw this ball, what happens? If I knock my plate off of my high chair, what happens? And then also pre-science skills like predicting. They might make a prediction internally about what's going to happen before they do something. If a child is in this trajectory schema, some things that they might enjoy are hammering nails, chopping food. Um, so again, activities in the kitchen. Um, they might enjoy something like cracking an egg. Um, again, they might enjoy that mixing. And then pounding toys. So this is an example here of uh, a hammer and clay. I also know this is done in the classroom uh, with something like a pumpkin around uh, October or November. People use uh, golf tees and a pumpkin uh, and allow the child to hammer the, the golf tees into the pumpkin. Again, it's giving them that input that they're looking at, uh, for where they're really getting to hone their gross motor skills and learn about that cause and effect. The next schema is the rotation schema. And this is when a child has an interest in things that spin or turn, drawing circles, or even spinning themselves. If there is a child who is interested in this rotation schema, some things that they're learning are how to move their bodies. Again, learning about cause and effect, what happens when I do this. And they're also really developing their fine and their gross motor skills. For children who are in this rotation schema, they might be interested in things like loading and unloading the washing machine and the dryer. Specifically, if you have a viewing window, right? The, the uh, washing machine that's shown here, once the child puts the clothes in, they're able to see them spin around and around. That's what they're really going to enjoy. Um, they might also enjoy locks and keys, screwdrivers and screws, nuts and bolts, again, because it involves the turning of the key or the turning of the screw. Practical life activities, things in the classroom like mixing, stirring, rolling dough. And then also a really fun one is our nature walks, where the child can observe spirals that occur naturally in nature, things like shells or snails. The next schema here is the enveloping schema. And I want you to really uh, focus in on this because we're going to explore in just a moment the enclosure schema, um, which is very similar to enveloping, but there's one distinct difference. So the enveloping schema includes an interest in covering objects or oneself, hiding in discrete places, whether that's themselves or an object. And uh, the difference here between the enclosure schema is that the entire object is being covered. So in the enveloping schema, the entire object or the entire body of the child uh, is being hidden. Where in the enclosure schema, that's not necessarily the case. And we'll look at what that means. So in this enveloping schema, children are, again, developing their fine and gross motor skills. They're developing a deeper sense of spatial awareness their visual tracking skills, and problem solving. And they're also learning an important lesson about object permanence. So this is the idea that things still exist even when they're not in plain sight. And this is why young children 
often really enjoy the game of peekaboo or hide and seek because they really think when you are hidden, right? When you cover up your body with a blanket, when you walk behind a wall to play hide and seek, they really think you're gone. That's why uh, babies or uh, toddlers will cry when you walk out of the room because they think you've disappeared, that you don't exist anymore. And they're really shocked when you come back and reappear into the room, right? They don't have this understanding or this conceptualization yet that people and objects still exist even when we can't see them. So this enveloping schema, when they're we're playing with the idea of hiding things from sight, including themselves, they really start to develop a deeper understanding of object permanence, that things and people do still exist even when we can't see them. For a child who's in an enveloping schema, some things they might enjoy are baking, right? Because you're mixing all of the ingredients together. Um, this goes for cooking as well. When you're mixing things together and they all meld together and seem to disappear, that's gonna be really interesting for a child in an enveloping schema. Wrapping gifts, because it appears that the gift is now hidden. Dressing themselves even, right? Like helping to get dressed because it appears that you're hiding uh, part of your own body and does it still exist under your shirt or under your socks or shoes? And then the first um, here that I saved until the end is an object permanence box. And this is um, a, a staple in a Montessori home and classroom. And what happens is that the child takes the ball uh, that's in the, the, the baby's hand here and drops it in the hole and it appears that it has disappeared, right? It goes into the hole and it seems to the child like it's gone. And then it comes back out, uh, this little hole right here in the front of the box and reappears. And so it's this uh, way for the child to engage, right? To have some hands-on opportunity to explore this object permanence concept, to realize that things do still exist even when we can't see them. And they're getting a firsthand opportunity um, to see what this looks like in practice. And so young children, especially those in the enveloping schema will really enjoy an object permanence box. And there's different versions of that box as well. When the child gets a little bit older and is ready for more of a challenge, there are some with doors or drawers on the front instead of the ball coming directly out, the child has to go looking for it. Uh, there's also what's known as a coin deposit box. So it makes it a little more challenging from a fine motor perspective, where instead of a ball, it's a little coin that they drop into a slot. But again, it's still the idea that the object, they're learning that the object still exists even when it can't be seen. So like I said, we're gonna take a look now at the enclosure schema, which is very similar to the enveloping schema because it's a child who has an interest in containing things or creating borders around objects or even themselves. The difference is, is that the object or the child can still be seen. They are not covered or uh, enveloped completely, right? They're just in an enclosure. So the child who is in an enclosure schema are learning uh, things like object permanence still. They're building pre-math skills like measuring what's going to fit inside something, prediction, and they're also developing their fine and gross motor skills. For a child who's in an enclosure schema, they might enjoy things like putting away groceries or dishes, right? They're putting things away somewhere. Um, containers with lids, learning how to open and close containers, especially if something is inside. Practical life activities, helping in the kitchen, things like making a sandwich. Um, and again, we see the red rods um, that are not here on the screen, but think back to uh, the, the last picture that we had. You see children making mazes with the red rods. Um, and again, that's gonna be that enclosure schema. It's creating that border around themselves. This is also why a lot of children like card to play in cardboard boxes because they're likely in that enclosure schema. If they wanna close the lid, right? And completely conceal themselves, it might be an enveloping schema. That's where we have to be detectives, if you will, and really closely observe. Um, but that's where the fascination comes from is that they're creating these borders around themselves. 
The next schema here is the positioning schema. And this is where a child has an interest in arranging or lining things up, uh, either objects or themselves in a particular way. I think it's really important to mention that a lot of people think when they see a child arranging things or lining things up, that it is a sign uh, that there might be a um, some kind of exceptionality, that the child might be neurodivergent. Um, there is some research to show that uh, individuals who are autistic enjoy things being in a specific order or a specific way and might line things up. And that is true. However, this is also a normal um, part of a child's development. If they're in this positioning schema, they're going to enjoy lining things up and arranging them in a certain way. And it's not necessarily uh, a sign that there's something else going on. Obviously, as a parent or a caregiver or an educator, if you have a suspicion that there might be something else happening, you do want to, to hone in uh, and, and lean into those observation skills and really see if there are other signs of uh, neurodivergent behavior. And if that's the case, then that's when you wanna make a comment to a parent or a guardian. Um, and maybe if you are the parent or caregiver, um, mention it to a healthcare professional just to get a second opinion if the, that child might need additional support. Um, but just to note that the positioning itself or lining things up itself does not mean uh, that the child is neurodivergent. It is a very common part of a child's development. So what is a child learning if they are arranging things or lining them up in this way? They're developing visual discrimination skills. Maybe they're lining things up from smallest to largest or from uh, darkest to lightest. And so they're developing those visual discrimination skills that allow them to do so. They're developing concentration, coordination to be able to arrange things in a certain way. Again, pre-math and science skills like problem solving, pattern exploration, classification, right? They're classifying things maybe by color, by size, by shape, um, and also planning skills. They're also exploring comparative studies when they compare different objects to one another as they investigate their similarities and their differences. So a lot going on underlying a child who just appears to be lining things up. If a child is in this positioning schema, some things that they might enjoy are what are known as sensorial materials in a Montessori early childhood classroom. These are things like the red rods we've mentioned already. Because the child can arrange them from longest to shortest or shortest to longest. Uh, something like the pink tower, which are uh, pink cubes that the child arranges from largest to smallest. Um, the brown stair that they arrange from thickest to thinnest. And then shown here are the knobbed cylinders. And there are four different versions of these. They, they go alongside the knobless cylinders, which are very similar, except they don't come in a block and don't have those little knobs on the top. So they're not practicing that pincer grasp. Um, but these knobbed and knobless cylinders, the children are arranging. Um, and the, they change depending on the set. Again, there's four of them. They arrange them from thickest to thinnest and tallest to shortest. So there are four different versions. And then uh, moving outside of the traditional Montessori materials, other activities that a child in a positioning schema might enjoy are sorting activities where they're sorting something by color or shape or size. Um, so you can see here that the child is matching the colored balls and the colored pegs to the containers of the, the same uh, color. Flower arranging is another great activity that children of positioning schema would enjoy, um, as well as care of the environment activities. So in a Montessori classroom, we call these practical life activities, um, care of the environment, things like sweeping and dusting because it's creating this sense of order, which is really what a child is craving um, that's kind of going back if you were here for the discussion on sensitive periods, which is something uh, particular to Montessori. A child in a positioning schema may also be in a, the sensitive period for order. And that's why they enjoy lining things up because it 
gives them that sense of order that they're seeking. And that's what children are really getting out of activities where they're taking care of the environment like dusting and sweeping. The next uh, schema here is the transporting or the transportation schema. And this includes an interest in carrying objects in one's pockets, one's hands, or in a bag, as well as moving or transporting oneself or others. In a transporting or transportation schema, young children are developing their fine and gross motor skills. They're also developing their spatial awareness. They're starting to develop an understanding of cause and effect. They're learning still about object permanence, like we talked about earlier, that things do still exist even when you can't see them. And they're developing pre-science skills like planning and measuring. For a child who's in a transporting schema, uh, they might enjoy activities like pouring, scooping, or spooning, things that we typically uh, find in a Montessori classroom in the practical life area, but also are very easily implemented in the home setting in the kitchen as well, right? Um, they might also enjoy cooking, gardening, and uh, things like helping to carry things, whether it's carrying the laundry to the laundry room or to the washing machine, uh, carrying groceries inside, anything. Um, there was a child, I'll just flip back really quickly here, carrying wood for a fire, right? Um, things that we might consider uh, manual labor, even if you will, young children really enjoy. It's the act of carrying that they're really, really fascinated by it, if they're in that transporting or transportation schema. Children in this schema also might be really fascinated by um, bi bicycles or tricycles. A common thing in a Montessori home is a, um, a pedal, a pedal, it's a non-pedal bike um, where it's called a balance bike, where the child, it, it doesn't have the training wheels and the child really uses their feet to learn how to move the bike and to balance their bodies and it prepares them for riding a normal bicycle uh, without training wheels or something different than a tricycle because they develop that core stability. Um, but a child in a transporting schema might really enjoy that because they're moving their body. Um, something like uh, pulling a wagon, right? Because they're moving objects in a wagon, a child in a transporting schema might enjoy as well. I did just want to uh, revisit for a second. It made me think about that when I was talking about being on the balance bike. We talked about a rotation schema earlier, which is a child who enjoys spinning uh, things or themselves or drawing circles. Um, something that the little one I nannied absolutely loved um, was a sit and spin. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, it's a little, a little pedestal that sits on the ground that the child sits on. And it has a little uh, tray almost that they hold, a little circle in the middle, a handle, if you will. And they spin it almost like a, if you're familiar at like Magic Kingdom, um, you can tell I'm from Orlando where we every, relate everything to theme parks. <laughs> um, but you spin the uh, handle in the middle and then what you're sitting on spins. That's why children love that ride so much um, is likely that they're in a transporting schema. The sit and spin is giving them the same, uh, that same input. They're enjoying spinning their bodies. There's also uh, a really common apparatus that used to be found on a lot of playgrounds here in the United States, not so much anymore, um, but the same kind of thing where the children get on it and someone spins it from the outside. And the child who's in a rotation schema is absolutely going to love that input as well. Okay, so if you are interested in learning more about schemas, these are some great resources that you can uh, take a look at to learn more. Uh, the books, Under Understanding Schemas and Young Children, again, again, is by a group of authors and stands out because it has a lot of really great illustrations and common behavior patterns that are related to schemas. And I think that's what's really helpful is looking at, you know, these are the behaviors, the child that I'm working with or that, you know, my own child, right? These are the behaviors I'm seeing and what does that mean is what parents and educators often ask. So that's why I think this book in particular is really helpful. 
However, it's important to know it can be a little bit of a more challenging read because it is geared towards practitioners rather than uh, parents and caregivers. The next resource here is called Schemas, a Practical Handbook, and this is by Laura England. It's an easier read that focuses on more on pragmatic ideas that's presented as a step-by-step -step guide. The next is Understanding Schemas in Young Children from Birth to Three, and this is by Francis, Francis Atherton and Kathy Nutt Brown. This is great if you're interested specifically in those early years, that time of zero to three uh, years old. It provides a lot of photos and illustrations as well as activity ideas for uh, children in each of the different schemas they might enjoy. And the last one here, schemas in the early years, exploring beneath the surface through observation and dialogue by Cap Arnold. Uh, I love this one because as I've mentioned a few times throughout the presentation, Observation really is the key of figuring out uh, what schema a child might be in, what kind of schematic play they're exhibiting, because you need to observe their behavior in order to figure those things out. Um, and observation really is the key to implementing the Montessori philosophy and pedagogy in general. So I am a, a large proponent of observation. Um, and this book really highlights the importance of utilizing those observations to identify a child's interests. And so that's why it really speaks to me. Uh, if you're looking for information specific to Montessori, because as I mentioned, schemas are not specific to Montessori, um, but can be helpful in allowing us to better understand a child's behavior. But if you're looking for information specific to the Montessori philosophy and pedagogy itself, I encourage you to uh, dive in and learn a bit more about sensitive periods. There is a uh, class that I've offered previously on this topic that I believe you can find on uh, the AIU YouTube channel. Um, and in just a moment, I'll also share my contact information, including my personal uh, LinkedIn account and social media accounts. And I've also shared it there as well. So if you wanna go back and take a look at that, um, that's gonna give you some information about the times in a child's life that they have this really uh, heightened ability to develop a skill or to gain new knowledge. And like I said, some of those things are going to be for order, uh, for tiny details or small objects, for movement. So they're very related to uh, schemas, but, but different as well. As promised, uh, here is some information on how you can contact me. Uh, I have my email address here if you have additional questions. Uh, after today's presentation, I have my website listed there. I'd love if you all uh, follow me along there as well as on my social media accounts. You can find me uh, using the handle at Montessori.matters. Uh, the logo is shown there at the top so you know you found the right page. I share a lot of Montessori education, uh, parenting and caregiving content that you might find helpful. So I'd love if you followed along. And uh, before I open it up to questions, I do just wanna say once again, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure as always uh, to be with you all. And hopefully uh, the topics that we covered here today will really help you better understand uh, the behavior of the children that you work with or that you care for, uh, or even your own children so that you can lean into their interests and offer them activities and experiences and an environment that uh, helps continue and- uh